Hi everybody, welcome to another week of An Amazing Animals. Now this week I thought we'd do something a little bit different and I'm going to show you some of the mini beasts that we keep here. Now we keep quite a wide range of different bugs and um, snails and spiders and cockroaches, this kind of thing, so a big mixture. Now they're all classified as an invertebrate. Now when we talk about an animal being an invertebrate, it's an animal without a backbone. So it's all your bugs. So they're, they're basically, they're bone structure or their skeleton on the outside of their body and that means they're particularly fragile so you have to be very very careful when holding them otherwise if you drop them they could break a leg off or maybe fracture the, the abdomen or the outside of the bodies. Okay so I'm gonna start showing you some of the unusual bugs we've got. Okay so what we've got here this is some new bugs that I've just ordered and had them delivered and these are called centurion cockroaches and you can see there's a mixture there. The, the, the adult ones are the ones, the big ones, of course, with the lovely markings on them. There's lots of little baby ones in there as well. Now, the big ones can't climb, whereas the little ones can climb. So we've got to make sure we put some very fine mesh over the top of this tank that I'm going to keep them in. Otherwise, they'll be escaping all over the place. A really attractive cockroach. We actually got about six or seven different types of cockroach that we keep here. These aren't particularly big, they're probably about the size, I'll put my finger down there and you can see probably about the size of my finger now. So not massive, but a very, very pretty cockroach. These are quite unusual, um, I haven't actually seen these for sale before. So uh, believe it or not, we actually managed to get these off of eBay. Um, someone sold them on there, so it's quite unusual. A pretty, pretty cool cockroach. Okay, so we've got something quite cool going on here. This is the largest type of spider in the world. It's called the Goliath bird eater. And what it's about to do is actually shed or change its old skeleton. Um, so what they do is they lay on their back like this and then slowly what she'll do is she'll pull the whole of this body out of the old skeleton. And what I'm going to do is during the day, I'm going to see if I can take various shots of this going on so you'll actually be able to hopefully see what's happening and hopefully all being well she'll come out as a beautiful new spider now size wise she's about the size of my hand so a pretty big spider indeed okay so what we've got here are some of our giant african millipedes now the difference between a millipede and a centipede is that one is a carnivore so it's only going to eat other animals that's a centipede whereas millipedes they're totally vegetarian they're herbivores so they're only going to eat dead leaves decaying matter that they find on the rainforest floor the other difference or another one of the differences is that a millipede has anywhere in between 240 to 260 legs whereas a centipede only has about 42 to 52 legs depending on the type as I said before, these are totally harmless. They can't do you any, any damage. They can't bite you or anything. Whereas if you were to get bitten by a centipede, you'd basically end up in hospital because it's like having a really uh, nasty sting and basically your arm um, swells up. So it's not very pleasant at all. Now, really lucky here. These are just opening up and you'll see that they start to move around. And you see the way they're moving there. Now, they're actually using their feelers or antennae to actually touch and they're working out where they can go by touching one side then the other side one side then the other side so if they come in between maybe a couple of rocks or something and they can actually touch either side they know they can't get through there therefore they wouldn't actually go all the way through so it's going to start moving here and you might be able to see just down really closely there, there's also little bugs that are all time like living on the millipede now what's going on here is something called a symbiotic relationship. It's where two animals actually live on each other. And the reason they, they do that is that these little bugs actually keep the millipede clean. And they'll go in between the legs and that and eat any food particles or any bits of flaking skin or anything like that to actually keep the, the millipede clean. It's pretty cool. So what we've got here are a couple of our giant African land snails and this one's called Bill and this one's called Ben. Okay so here we've got a couple of our giant 
African land snails. Now the one on the left is called Bill and the one underneath there is called Ben. Okay. Now if I go really close here you can see these long stalks on the top of their head. Now they're, they're eyes, they don't have eyes like you and me, um, so they can only see forward. But their eyes, are, I'm going to go right in close, there we are, yeah. and they can see all the way around. And that's really useful to them because they need to be able to look out for food. And they're going to eat green matter, things like lettuce, cucumber, any leaves. But also they need to eat bones. And now the reason they eat bones is they need to have a source of calcium. Now, we get our calcium from things like milk and cheese and dairy products. Obviously, the snail can't go up to a cow and say, can I have a litre of milk? It's not going to happen. So what they're going to do is they're going to find some old bones oh, and they're going to climb up on them and they're going to eat them. And they don't have teeth like you and me. They've got something called a rasp and a rasp is a little bit like a cheese grater. And they can actually grate that bone. And that's what helps make the shell go very hard. Now, the shell is designed to be very, very strong. In fact, if you, you could almost stand on this one without it actually breaking. The new shell actually grows from this edge here. Yeah. So once this is formed around here, yeah, that never grows anymore. So the new shell is going to go at the edge there. Now, they actually use that shell to protect themselves from animals that want to eat them, predators. And what they can do is they can pull the whole of this great big body right round into that shell, right round the curve of the shell. And that means that most mammals and most birds can't actually get in there to eat them. There are a couple that have actually worked out how to um, be able to eat a land snail. One is a baboon, and what it will do is it will use a tool. So it will use a stick or a stone, and it will chip away at the edge of the shell here until it exposes the snail, then they can pull it out and eat it. And the other one's a bird called a ground hornbill. And what they'll do is they'll, the hornbills find them in the wild, and they, they pick them up and they throw them in the air and drop them on stones, and eventually that will break the shell. And I've actually seen that happen in Africa, so that was pretty cool. So that's a giant African land snail. OK, so this is another one of our really small animals. This is another type of poison dart frogs. And these ones come from Colombia, which is a big country in South America. And you can probably hear in the background there's one of the frogs actually croaking. He's trying to attract a mate at the moment. Really beautiful curved frog. Um, we've only got one of these at the moment. They're actually quite hard to get hold of. Um, I'm not sure if it's a boy or a girl. They're going to eat tiny little fruit flies and other little insects that are found on the rainforest floor. And to put that into perspective, that, is, that whole frog isn't much bigger than your, your thumbnail. So it's a very, very tiny little frog indeed. Surprising though, they can actually live for quite a long time. One of these frogs can actually live up to about 18 years old which is quite amazing for such a small animal. I don't think it's going to do much. I'm hoping it's not going to jump. Oh, there we go. I'm going to get a really good close up there. Of the poison dart frog. A very tiny one. Actually looking at this one, if you look at the front feet there, um, they're actually quite divided. So it's probably a male, although I haven't actually heard this one calling yet. Okay, this is one of the types of stick insects that we keep here. These are called giant prickly stick insects and they come from a place called Papua New Guinea. Now the way that these ones protect themselves from getting eaten is they use something called camouflage. And camouflage basically means they blend in with their surroundings. Now they can't fly, they're too big, they don't have wings and they're not designed to run very fast. So the only way is that they can protect themselves is by finding a twig or a branch, sitting on there, staying really, really still, Hopefully they won't get seen and then they won't get eaten. Now, they actually have green blood. And the reason they've got green blood is all these plants. And if you get a lettuce leaf or cabbage leaf and squeeze it really hard, the juice that comes out is green. And that's where they get that from. Okay. Now, the people in uh, Papua New Guinea, where these actually come from, actually use these as part of their everyday life. And what they'll do is in the wild, these insects eat plants. Now, the plants they eat have got medicine in them. Now obviously what comes in one end goes out the other end, they go to the toilet. And what the native Indians do is they'll go beneath the bushes and the trees where these large insects are with half a coconut shell, pick up all those little poos and then they'll take them back to their campfire, spread them out on a banana leaf and dry them and then they'll store them. Then when they've got a headache they're going to eat those poos. So that's pretty cool. Okay. Okay so I think I've already shown you these once before but these are our uh, giant leaf insects and uh, they've actually grown since last time I, I did a little video of them and what they've done is they've actually 
um, eaten lots of food uh, and then basically got too big for their bodies. So they go up to the top of the tank, hang up on there and then slowly they'll pull themselves out of their old skin and then they come back to being normal again. So again, these just eat blackberry leaves, a really, really cool insect. And we've got two or three different types of these. This is the largest type in the world and they come from Malaysia. Very close, they almost like look identical. So you'd, to a leaf, look with the back spine coming down there and the little bits of um, leaf stalks coming out of the side there. So a really cool insect. Now a really interesting fact about these particular ones is that you don't have any boys, they're all females. And the females are able to lay eggs which are totally viable and they will hatch into little baby sticking sets. There's no males in this species whatsoever. Okay, so this is another, uh, it's actually an arachnid, so it's a, in the same family as spiders. And this is one of our Asian forest scorpions. Now, generally as a rule with a scorpion, if they have big claws, they use those to catch their prey. And they normally have a small sting. Whereas if you have a scorpion that's got a small um, claws at the front and a big sting, they're the ones which can be potentially lethal. In fact, there are a couple, of, there's about four or five species in the world. There's one in Israel. There's one in India, there's one in Texas, and one in Australia, that there's enough poison in a scorpion to actually kill you. Now I'm gonna show you something really cool because I'm gonna take these over into the dark. So they almost disappear. Okay, so it's almost, the scorpion's still there. But now what I've got here is a UV light. And I'm gonna shine it on the scorpion. And you can see, they actually fluoresce. They glow in the dark. Now the scientists don't actually know why they do this. Um, they think possibly that other animals, predators, things that want to eat them can actually see that. So they'd obviously try to keep away from them. But really, really cool. And that's just so I'll turn the light off so you can't actually see the scorpion in the dark. And then on again to actually see them glowing in the dark. So really, really cool animal. Okay, so we've come to yet the end of yet another journey around some of the lovely and interesting animals we have here. Uh, next week I'm probably going to take you around and look at some of the tortoises and turtles that we keep um, and, and what we do with them in the summer because they can actually go outdoors in the summer and uh, I've got like a pond or a reel it's called that they actually go in and hopefully with the weather turning nicely we're going to get them in there soon. Okay, have a good week everybody, stay safe and enjoy the weather. Bye bye. Hi everybody, welcome to another week of An Amazing Animals. Now this week I thought we'd do something a little bit different and I'm going to show you some of the mini beasts that we keep here. Now we keep quite a wide range of different bugs and um, snails and spiders and cockroaches, this kind of thing, so big mixture. Now they're all classified as an invertebrate. Now when we talk about an animal being an invertebrate, it's an animal without a backbone. So it's all your bugs. So they're, they're basically, they're bone structure or their skeleton on the outside of their body and that means they're particularly fragile so you have to be very very careful when holding them otherwise if you drop them they could break a leg off or maybe fracture the, the abdomen or the outside of the body. Okay so I'm gonna start showing you some of the unusual bugs we've got. <laughs> 